All right. So we're continuing in the um, what is it? The herd of healing, and we're going to start in the healing is is uh, healing is guaranteed through the atonement. So it is God's will for you to be healed because of Jesus' death on the cross. That's what they teach. All right, we'll get right on. And then I have a, a video at the end. Um, I disagree. I don't think it's prohibited. What if I hit that? All right. Foundational to faith preachers teaching is always God's will for a person to be physically healed. Is their assertion that physical healing is paid for, provided for in the atonement? The atonement, of course, the word that we give to the work that Jesus did on the cross. Now, we saw earlier how the faith preachers don't believe that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. They believe he paid for our sins down in hell. But we dealt with that earlier. But watch this from Andrew Womack. Jesus placed your and my sickness and diseases, infirmities, upon Jesus, and he bore them 2,000 years ago. If he already paid for your healing, how can you doubt that you are healed? So, according to the prosperity preachers, Jesus paid for our sins on the mm -hmm. cross, and because he paid for our sins, he also paid for our sickness and disease, and therefore... Uh, we should not have to bear either our sins or our sickness and disease. We should be fully delivered from them. And they use as their textual support Isaiah 53, 4, and 5, which says this, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And they take these two words that I have highlighted here, griefs and sorrows, and they say that another way to render these two words is as sickness and pain, respectively. And you know what? They're right. These two words in Hebrew do have multiple possible renderings. So how do you know which rendering is correct? You know which rendering is correct by the context of the passage. So let's look at the context of the passage. It becomes very clear, but just by reading the very next verse, verse 5, which says this, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So very clearly, the primary context of Isaiah 53 is not physical healing. It's spiritual healing. Not healing from sickness and disease, but healing from sin. We see that from these two words, transgressions and iniquities. And yet, how many times have we heard Benny Hinn or one of these other prosperity preachers say, by his stripes, we are healed. So you ought to be physically healed. But that's not the primary context. The primary context is healing from sin. In fact, read Isaiah 53. Beginning in chapter 52, all the way through 53, the whole thing is talking about sin, transgression, iniquity. He bore the sins of many. It has nothing to do with cancer or arthritis. So, what is the answer to our question? Is physical healing provided for in the atonement? Yes. Yes, it absolutely is. Dear friends, the reason that I have cerebral palsy, the reason I walk with crutches, is because of sin. Not my personal sin, but the sin of Adam and Eve. The reason many of you right now are wearing eyeglasses, that's because of sin. Not your personal sin, but the sin of Adam and Eve. Next time you catch a cold, you can blame Adam and Eve for that. It's just one of the consequences of living in a fallen world. When they ate of that fruit, whatever that fruit was, we don't know that it was an apple, that's just what's in the coloring books. But when they ate of that fruit, sin entered the world, so did sickness and disease and ultimately death, physical and spiritual death. So the reason we get sick is a result of sin. When Jesus came and died on the cross, he paid for our sins, and he also paid for all of the consequences of those sins, one of which is sickness and disease. So yes, physical healing is provided for in the atonement. But here's where the faith preachers get it very, very wrong. 
Not all of the benefits of the atonement are promised to be fully realized this side of heaven. Okay? Not all the benefits of Jesus' atonement are promised to be realized this side of heaven. Some of the benefits of Jesus' atonement we will not realize until the other side of heaven. And healing from sickness and disease is one of those benefits. To give you another example of this, a glorified body is also provided for in the atonement. Well, raise your hand if you've got your glorified body. Nobody? Nobody here has a glorified body? Why not? It's provided for in the atonement. It's not promised to be realized here. Dear friends, when we die and go to heaven, all of us who are in Christ Jesus, we are in union with Christ through the regenerating work of God's Holy Spirit. When we die and go to heaven, we're not going to take our cancer, our sickness, our arthritis, our CP, our muscular dystrophy. We're not taking any of those things with us. Why? Because our Healing has been provided for, bought and paid for with the blood, death, and bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? To be real honest with you, if you'll stop and think about it, when we die and go to heaven, I don't think it's even going to cross our minds that we no longer have our sickness and disease. I don't think we're going to give it a second thought because we're going to have better things to think about. Dear friends, we will be in the presence of Christ. We will be in the presence of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and Omega, the one who spoke the universe into existence. We will be in such awe over Him. I don't think it's even going to cross our minds that we no longer have our crutches or our arthritis or wearing our glasses. Sometimes we have such an earthly view of heaven, don't we? You know, so many people think of heaven as this big family reunion. That's the way Don Piper describes heaven. That's one of the ways we know he hasn't been there. Heaven's this great big family reunion. We'll see Grandma and Grandpa. We'll walk on streets of gold. Will we? Yeah, sure. We will be reunited with our loved ones, provided, of course, that they were in Christ when they preceded us in death. Sure. But you know what? We will be joining them in doing what they're doing right now, worshiping Christ, praising Christ, being in all of Christ, loving Him, serving Him, worshiping Him for all of eternity, enjoying Him forever. He is who makes heaven, heaven. Christ. We're not going to be worried about not having our wheelchairs or crutches or aches and pains. Friends, we're going to have better things to think about. He is the joy and the glory of heaven. He is who makes heaven, heaven. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. He is who makes heaven heaven. What of the biblical record? Can we look through the Bible and find examples of people who loved the Lord, were faithful servants of God, and yet were not healed? Absolutely. Trophimus was left sick at Miletus. Epaphroditus was sick to the point of death. The Apostle Paul encouraged Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach in his frequent ailments. Now I find this very interesting. Notice that the Apostle Paul did not write to Timothy and say, uh, Timothy, go see a faith healer. And be sure you sow a seed into his ministry so you can reap a harvest. Take a little wine for your stomach in your frequent elements. And I find this interesting on yet another level. 
because the Apostle Paul wrote this to Timothy about the year A.D. 64. About A.D. 64. Back up 10 years to the year A.D. 54. What was going on in the year A.D. 54? The events, events of Acts chapter 19 were going on. Well, what was happening in Acts chapter 19? Extraordinary miracles of healing. So extraordinary that even handkerchiefs and aprons were being taken forth from the Apostle Paul, delivered to sick people, and God was healing the sick through the agents of these handkerchiefs and aprons at distances, remotely. Extraordinary miracles of healing in the year A.D. 54. Fast forward 10 years, year A.D. 64. No handkerchiefs and aprons going forth from the Apostle Paul. What changed? Something changed, did it not? Could it be that even in that 10-year span, that the apostolic gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues, physical healing, had already begun to fade away? Had already begun to pass out of operation? They had already fulfilled the purpose for which they were given? Two years later, Paul writing 2 Timothy, and he says that he was with Trophimus, and he left him sick at Miletus. This was the Apostle Paul. No handkerchiefs and aprons. Paul didn't heal him. He left him sick. Left him sick. Interesting, internal evidence, is it not, that even by that time, that the apostolic gifts had already begun to fade away. As I said earlier, do I believe that God still heals people today? Yes. But only when it is His sovereign will to do so. Is it common? No. I don't think miraculous healings are common. But on occasion, yeah, sure, God does it. Is that the same thing as the gift of healing? No, it's not. No, it's not. Two totally different things. Job. Job is the 800-pound theological gorilla sitting in the living room of the prosperity preachers. <laughs> None of whom want to admit is there. Job's awkward for the prosperity preachers. It's hard to ignore an entire book out of the Bible. You know, but here you have Job. He was a man who was upright and righteous. Doesn't mean he was sinless, but he had done nothing really deserving of all the calamities that fell upon him. And yet God still allowed Satan to come and strike from Job everything that he had. His possessions destroyed. His family dead. His own health deteriorated. Job suffered horrifically. Like probably none of us can even imagine. Job's a problem for the prosperity preachers. Job wasn't having his best life now. So what do they do with Job? Well, you know what they do to Job? They turn the tables on Job. And they say, the reason these calamities fell upon Job, they were all results of his negative confessions. Job spoke negative words, and he brought all of these calamities upon himself. Do they really teach this? Yes, they do. This from Joyce Meyer. She writes, For the thing which I greatly fear comes upon me, and that of which I am afraid befalls me. Fear is a terrible emotion, a self-fulfilling one. Job had fears concerning his children. Did he? No, it doesn't say that. Concerning his children, it finally reached a place in his life where he saw his fears coming to pass. The Bible says it will be unto us as we believe. Totally takes that out of context as well. And she says that principle works in the negative as well as the positive. So Job tapped into the dark side of the force. And he, he brought all these calamities upon himself. Poor old Job. It was all his fault completely misses the point of the book of Job. I mean, misses it entirely. You know what the point of the book of Job is, dear friends? The sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. God can do whatever he wants to do. And sometimes that means making us sick. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God makes people sick? Now, you tell that to a prosperity person, that God makes people sick, they'll probably faint right on the spot. They just get the vapors. You know, they won't be able to handle that. But if God doesn't make people sick, then somebody needs to, to tell him because he seems to think that he does. Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. 
The Lord said unto Moses, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him dumb, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Friends, that's God talking there. I don't know how you get around that. Pretty clear, is it not? Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him dumb, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? God speaking again, Deuteronomy 32. See now that I, I am he, there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Put that verse in your prosperity pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Sometimes God makes people sick. Now why does he do that? Just to watch people suffer? No. But sometimes God makes people sick to sanctify us and to glorify himself. To glorify himself. And ultimately, everything that God does is for his glory. And sometimes God is most glorified in us when we suffer, when we are persecuted, when we go through trials. Met uh, this man named Rich. Rich lived in Long Island, New York. Rich was born able-bodied. Nothing wrong with Rich at all. He was saved when he was 19 years old. God saved him. And then just a few years later, Rich had a motorcycle accident. And it left him completely paralyzed. No use of his legs. Very, very, very limited use of his arms. Rich lives lived with his brother and his sister-in-law, his brother's wife, neither of whom are believers but Rich was. And every Sunday morning, Rich would ask his brother and sister-in-law to get him up out of bed. They'd get him up out of bed Sunday morning, bathing, dressing, put him in his electric wheelchair, and Rich would drive his electric wheelchair five miles, one way to church, every single Sunday. And he never missed. Even when it was raining, they would put a poncho over him. And he would drive his electric wheelchair five miles, one way to church, in the rain. The pastor told me, he said, Justin Rich is the most faithful church member I've got. He had bumper stickers on the back of his wheelchair with scripture verses on them. Quite literally, a rolling testimony for Christ. Friends, God is glorified in that. God is glorified in that. How many people saw Rich every Sunday driving his electric wheelchair to church? He was a joy to talk to. God's glorified in that. Rich is now in heaven. And you know what? He actually recorded a testimony not long before he died. And he wanted that video to be played at his own funeral. And it was. And do you know what he did in that video that was recorded not long before he died? He addressed his brother and his sister-in-law. And from the video screen, at his own funeral, Rich, Rich was preaching the gospel. God's glorified in that. And yet we've got prosperity preachers today who tell you that you should have your best life now. Joel Osteen talking about how he and his wife Victoria were believing God for a good parking spot at the mall. And they were just driving around the parking lot because all the good parking spots were taken, mind you. But they kept believing God for a good parking spot. And they drove down the aisle of cars and wouldn't you know it, the car in the very front spot pulled out, pulled away just in time for Joel and Victoria to pull in and get that good parking spot up front. And Joel Osteen says that's the favor of God. That's why when Heather and I are driving... And we find a good parking spot. We look at each other and go, the favor of the Lord. 
But there's another vi there's another video I want to show you. Um, this is from Bethel Church, which is uh, an up and coming uh, heresy farm, um, notorious. Um, because one of the things that has become more and more popular um, is people will profess to have the gift of prophecy. Well, the good thing about 2020, and I mean, regardless of your political party, something good did come out of Trump not getting reelected, and that is all these people who prophesied that he would. You, you heard from God. God told you he would, and he didn't. Well, what are they doing now? What are they pushing now? Uh, as one of my friends on YouTube uh, expresses, is they're doing damage control. Now they're pushing and teaching that just because you get a prophecy wrong does not make you a false prophet. Don't believe me? Suffer through this. You skipped out in 1 Corinthians 14. Down to verse 31. This is Paul who is writing this letter to the church of Corinth. He says this, For you can all prophesy. I want you to say that with me. For you can all prophesy. Turn to your neighbor and say she's talking to you. One by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. You can all prophesy. He's making it clear right here that the gift is for everyone. He's not going to say in the previous, in the beginning of that chapter to lust after this spiritual gift, but just say, hey, just kidding, it's actually not available for you. You can all prophesy, just kidding, not you, not you, not you. The truth of the matter is, is we can all prophesy, just a lot of people choose not to. And as with everything that God gives us, if we are good stewards, it will grow. But we have to steward the gift of the prophetic in order for it to grow. Amen? He doesn't give the gift of the prophetic to a special few. He doesn't just give it to the apostles. He doesn't just give it to the tele-evangelists. He doesn't just give it to the anointed ones or the people that are leading multitudes of people. He gives it to every single believer. So it's good news, right? If we believe in Jesus Christ, then we have the gift of prophecy. You may never have used it before. You may use it every day. But you have it. And it's up to us to determine what we're going to do with that. Amen? Here is what I am not saying. That every single person is called to be a prophet. As in the office of a prophet. The office of a prophet, as with the rest of the fivefold ministry in Ephesians 4.1, is for the governmental equipping of the saints. So, so there are some people out there who hold the office of a prophet. But every single person has been given the gift no one does. of prophecy. That's the difference. So prophetic is for every person and every personality type. It's not just for the extroverts. not just for the people who feel comfortable speaking to strangers. It's for every single person. Whether you like people or not. I'm going to invite some of my friends to come up. We have a high value for the prophetic, as I've said, and we, um, I teach every now in a prophetic 101 equipped class, and uh, if you've gone through this class and you've gotten an invitation to be further equipped or to participate in a group of us who just get together and we just practice prophesying. 
We just have a lot of fun practicing the prophetic. We are growing our gifts. We are working those spiritual muscles. And we just prophesy over each other, and it is a ton of fun. And guess what? Sometimes we get it wrong. I know. I know. And that does not make people a false prophet. I'm not going to make you suffer through that. What Bethel does very well is they lull you. Their, their worship is to lull you into some sort of hypnotic state. Um, that's why their music is very repetitive, very shallow, but it's highly repetitive and, and trance-like. And then obviously with that, I mean, it seems intimate. But because they hype up the gifts, it's, I had an intimate experience with God. It's like, no, you just had a really bad teacher. So, let's go back to the beginning with Justin. He spoke of healing in the atonement, right? And what passage do they use? They use Isaiah 53 to cite this. So Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 5. Can you read that for me? <clears throat> Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. So they use this as a proof text for physical healing in the atonement, that that is promised to us, or that is obtained or achieved through Jesus' death on the cross. Well, how is this refuted? Because it is true. We, we are, you know, sin and, and all the effects of sin were taken care of in the atonement, but is that what this text is really saying? It's talking about sin. It's talking about sin. Well, how do we know for certain it's not? Because, because after all, he talked about um, the, the, like some translations, I know mine says it was our sickness that he bore and our pains that he carried. Sickness and pains, they translate that way in Hebrew. How do we determine how it's to be translated if it has multiple meanings? Context, context, context. context. The, the proper steps of biblical interpretation. The three easy steps of Biblical interpretation, context, context. What surrounds it is it addresses sin. It talks about the sin. It talks about how he bore our sin. That we are, that we are atoned, that our sins are atoned for as a result of his bearing. In fact, the by his stripes we are healed is such an incredibly beautiful verse, especially Isaiah had no clue Jesus was going to be beaten with the cat of nine tails. No clue. Yet Jesus had stripes. I'm going to think out loud here a minute. But Get it. By, their, um, by that logic, in that passage, wouldn't that also mean that if we're, you know, he bore our sin, that we would not sin anymore either? By that, like they're saying that well, now you're just taking the text to their logical conclusion, and we can't have that. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I think some of them do say that. Todd White does insinuate that he doesn't sin anymore. And he has been, you know, he might go, oh, no, I, I've never said that. But there were very, very strong, it, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, I, I could have swore I heard him once, but he definitely gets real close to saying I don't sin anymore. He might have said I stopped sinning. It's like, well, you, I mean, yeah, if you don't count them. It's like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like, yeah, if you're playing basketball with your kid, you're obviously not going to keep score because you're going to destroy him. But if you're not keeping, keeping count of your sins, of course you don't sin because it's not keeping track anyway. So yeah, Isaiah 53 is used by the faith teachers to somehow justify that it is always God's will to heal you because of, Jesus, because of the atonement. And that is true. However... What is the truth of this passage as it pertains to the atonement? What are are we guaranteed that we will be healed? Yeah, after we're dead and rise again. We we 
for, for some people, God may, may heal them. But even then, it's like Lazarus. He was resurrected from the dead. What happened to him again? Bummer. He had to go through that twice. You know, we will experience all the that was achieved in the atonement, in, in Jesus' death on the cross, certainly upon the resurrection. I used to joke around with youth kids because you've got to make things stick somehow. And for teenagers... This seemed to do it. We talked about our new bodies, and we talked about healthy bodies and what they might look like. And so what they walked away with is everyone's going to have abs in heaven. <laughs> but, that, but that stuck with, but, but that, when, I, when we talk about our new body, that's what they, they go, we're going to have new bodies. We're going to have perfected, resurrected bodies. But that's what they walked away with was, you know, we're gonna, all going to have abs. And they said, the funny thing is, when we prayed for food, they would pray for that. Lord, change this burger and the broccoli on the way down and give us abs. <laughs> and it's like, if that's what you're taking from it, so be it. You know that you're not going to... If anything, it sticks because they know they're not going to have abs. Lord knows I gave up years ago. But our, our new resurrected bodies, they are going to be perfect. They're not going to be... There's not going to be any chance of disease. There's not going to be misfirings in the brain. There's not going to be chemical imbalances, none of that. So we are not promised that we will realize this, this side of heaven. But we are promised, certainly, in heaven. One of the things he talked about was Job. Job seems to be a problem for the faith teachers due to the nature of his suffering. But they seem to find a way out of it. And how did they do that? What do they say Job did? It was his fault. He, it was his fault and he thought negatively. Well, was what first jumped out to my mind, though, were his three friends. Those were the accusations they threw at him. But Joyce Meyer said that he had negative confession, and that made it come to pass in his life. Job chapter 1, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, and he considered my servant Job, no one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Oh, man. One of the things that Justin has, has brought up before is just how weak the prosperity God is. So, negative confessions and obedience to the Lord our negative confessions overpower your obedience to the Lord, according to the prosperity gospel. That's a very weak God, is it not? That what I say can overpower His will, His desire, and His blessing. Is that not a very weak God? That I, a mere mortal, can just say something and overpower Him? But... Do you see how teachings are beginning to blend? What does this kind of ring with that my words can have that kind of power? What does that go back to? Little, Little God's doctrine. You start to see how these connect. But you also see how much further off the right path they're getting. They've made their own theology, but you see how it starts to connect, but it's connecting going completely the opposite direction. Now what we watched at the end is rough. Um, let's put aside the fact she was even in the pulpit. We could have avoided this altogether had Bethel not compromised. That is the first thing, if you notice, that's the first thing that gets compromised in a church that no longer upholds the authority of Scripture. As soon as the authority of Scripture is gone, that's the first thing to happen. Every single time. Every single time. Now let's put that aside, and let's just dismantle what horrible theology was there. She cites 1 Corinthians 14.31. Who's got that one? For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. All right. I got my little stopwatch. It, it may not take 30 seconds. But if everyone can turn to 1 Corinthians 14... I doubt it'll take 30 seconds, but I'm not, I'm not going to do more than that. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to use the three rules of biblical interpretation and, ex and express the first one as soon as you find out, express why what she said that you all should prophesy 
is wrong, just by the context. Can we say it's since we know it? Go. It's out of context because that was how gifts are supposed to be used. It was order, like how the order was supposed to be in the church. Like if somebody spoke in tongues, they had to be an interpreter. If somebody prophesied, they had to do it. Well, if I wanted order. So when, when Paul's saying you all can prophesy, who's the all? The ones that have the gift. Of the ones who have the gift. Because surrounding that text, Paul is going through proper, proper practice within the church. That if you speak in tongues, if there's two or three, there must be an interpreter. We don't see that. But there must be an interpreter. But he also, within that context, is, is speaking to those who have the gift of prophecy. You can't just go up and say one at a time. Why does there need to be order? No. How, is, how are you ever going to really listen if everyone's talking? I heard a funny joke on uh, social media when, when you kind of see the, you know kind of crazy things happen in a church, and someone said they didn't catch the Holy Spirit; they caught the showly spirit. And it's this look at me kind of thing. Look how spiritual. Look how it's manifesting in my life. And, da, da, da. and so that will absolutely happen. And so Paul to suppress that he goes, "There's got to be order, and only those who have the gift are to do it." Well, what's interesting, though, is if you go to 1 Corinthians 12, just two, two chapters before, 1 Corinthians 12, if we look at verses 8 through 10, what does this say about prophecy? Does it say what she said, which is, you all can do it? 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit, to another a message of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of feeling by the one Spirit. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, different kinds of languages. To another, interpretation of languages. So, I messed up. It, 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 verse 11. But one, but one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing each one individually just as he wills. So in this context, what are we seeing? What are we seeing happening with the with the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts? Not everyone's getting the same gifts. Not everyone's getting the same gifts. Why is that? If your body was nothing but hands, how's that going to go? No. You couldn't walk. Couldn't walk. Couldn't see. Sweet handshakes, though, but that's about it. We all can't be the same thing. And that's why Paul uses it both times when he speaks of spiritual gifts. He, he refers it back to the body. But he also talks about how we can't have a body part that is jealous of another because they're not that. If you have a hand that's jealous, they're not an eye. Well, okay, well, what if you were an eye? Well, now we don't have a hand. It just seems, and so Paul does this for the church to understand you have a place and purpose to serve the kingdom of God. You're not going to be gifted the same. And, when, and even in the apostolic age, we see these supernatural gifts being distributed according to the will of God the Holy Spirit. So even within the context, it says you know, that another is given this, another is given this, another prophecy. It's according to the Holy Spirit and, 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 and God's will. That's, you have no say in that. That is God's sovereign will as to how he's going to gift you. Now, where you go with that, there's a lot of people who sit on their spiritual gifts. we got more spiritual gift assessments out there. Feel free to take one. But one of the things she said was, there's a group that gets together, and she said, and we practice prophesying. Did anyone uh, cringe on that one? <laughs> practice prophesying. Where on earth is that in Scripture? And why is that? She said, she said sometimes we get it wrong. She said that in that, and if God is giving it to you, you're not going to get it wrong. But to practice, it just doesn't make sense that you would practice prophet. When, when a prophet spoke, this is why they try and separate it. Prophets prophesy, do they not? Yes. Well, no, you have to, you're a prophet, 
But you prophesy, but you're not a prophet. Well, there goes compromising scripture right there. You know, prophecy. We practice prophesying. Here's, here's what I don't get. When a prophet spoke, did they have any question as to whether or not God told them? Did Jeremiah, when he proclaimed something, ever put a hedge of, well, listen, it may not. Or he said, thus saith the Lord. When David was caught in his sin with Bathsheba, <clears throat> was he called out with, listen, I, I may be wrong, David. No, it was God saw it and here's what you did. There was no hesitation. There was no question. There was, and there was no wrong. The only time there was wrong, Deuteronomy 18, 21 through 22. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. <clears throat> it doesn't make you a false prophet. Yes, it does. <laughs> it absolutely does. You know why? Scripture says it. But not only there. Jeremiah 14, 14. I know I threw, I threw you off because I, I made you turn to 1 Corinthians. Yeah. Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or, sp uh, or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, div divinations, idolatries, and the delusion of their own minds. Let's get into some good stuff here. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign of wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, Let us call other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dream. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. Is the God your is the Lord your God must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commandments and obey him, serve him, and hold fast to him. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death because he preached rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you to land of slavery. He has tried to turn you away from the Lord your God, commanded you to follow. You must purge evil from among you. Ooh, if we were OT, what's going to happen? You're going to die. Yep. So how does God feel about getting it wrong. Strongly. So it's as though God doesn't like you gossiping about something he said, saying as though it were. There's a really funny um, Todd Friel, who has a wretched radio program, uh, showed a, a another woman who was a, a faith healer, or I don't know who she was, uh, but they did a tent meeting, revival kind of a thing, and this local pastor went not, not, but to, not to experience in the sense of, oh, I'm, I'm here because I support it, but to, to take it in and be able to, you know, teach soundly his congregation. Well, she called him up, and she began to prophesy over him. And the the sweet thing she said, thus saith the Lord to him. I think we're at probably correct. But the moment she gave him the microphone, he he said, we need to be in deepest prayer. For the, for the false teachings that she is espousing and those who are following. And then her tune changed instantly. And, and she kicked him out of the tent and, and said, you know, he's of demons. It's like, wait, did you just say he seeks after the Lord? Didn't you just say these things? And you, you know, thus saith the Lord, you are a mighty, mighty instrument in my hand. Nope, you're of the devil. I mean, Seriously? But this is what they are beginning to espouse, is just because you get a prophecy wrong, it does not make you a false prophet. Well, that is exactly what a false prophet is. In fact, God says it. How will we know when it doesn't come true, when it doesn't come to pass? But now, this is what they're saying. Just because you get it wrong doesn't make you that. And you know what's really frustrating? is if people would just read 
the word of God, they would leave these churches, they would hold these speakers, so-called professors of the faith, in accountability, show their true colors, and leave that church. But they don't. Why? Here's what the church is They're being told up. And they, as Paul said, and they will place for them teachers who will tickle their ears. Look, I want you to leave church edified, but I want you to leave church edified because you learned more about how amazing your Savior is. In spite of you. If I can learn more about His love and grace for me in spite of my sin, that edifies. But if I leave there thinking I'm awesome, how does that bring glory to God? That brings glory to me. It gives me a false sense. In fact, it's, it's that dump of dopamine that they give you. And guess where you got to go? you got to come back, get your fix. That's how addictions work. If I go to church, I get this dump of dopamine because there's this hyper-emotional worship service, hyper-emotional uh, preaching. And I get my dump of dopamine and I can go about my way, but then I need another fix, so I come back next week. But if you have the sustaining truth of God's word, not saying you, you are, you can skip next week, but you'll grow in knowledge and truth and understanding. And so when those storms come, you're going to be, you're going to be held fast in the truth of God's word, not some hyper-emotional experience you have. And so for them to say, you're not a false prophet because you got a prophecy wrong. They're wrong. They're absolutely wrong. Now what they'll try and do is take the weight off of themselves because I'm not a prophet. I'm not a capital P. I'm, I'm just prophesying. You're, you're, you're trying to separate an office and a gift and what they're, what they're trying to do is to build this hedge around um, their error. Why? Because they're not true prophets. Because they're not truly speaking of God, from God. They're not. So they have to protect themselves. But if we have somebody who we love dearly, who's caught up into this, well, ultimately what's taking place is we've got to help them see the, the true authority of God's Word. During the Reformation, one of the solas, which means alone, that they would banner cry against uh, the Roman Catholic Church at that time was sola scriptura, scripture alone. Meaning, scripture is our authority. Not the preacher, not the pope, not a priest, not a bishop. Scripture alone is our authority. If that's the case, then why are we not in it? I go up there and say something stupid, are you going to catch it? I sure hope so, because you're in the Word. Because certainly if they go up there and tell you Trump's going to win the election and he doesn't, why are they still in the pulpit? If this was Old Testament, they wouldn't be here at all. And yet the church continues to lift up these teachers, because why? As, as, as Jesus said, you adulterous generation yearn for a sign. Gifts above the giver. And so, I know that this, this stuff, and, and, and look, I don't recommend you following me on Facebook, but you kind of got a feeling what was going on today. <laughs> and it was that video that really got me. It was really frustrating. Um, but it just goes back to, we have the actual words of God. And he painstakingly preserved that over the last 2,000 years that we would have this right in front of us. And we don't even open it. It's the greatest love letter ever told, and we won't even open it. Again, when we got a little note from our significant other, the first thing we did when we got to class was we opened that bad boy up. God's telling you how he wants to save you, redeem you, and sanctify you, bring you closer to him, and it's like, ah... I'm busy. I hope that this spurs us. And I hope that we are going to be like the Bereans because 
There's so many people that are being led away from Christ. And that's, and that's kind of the whole thing. When, when we read the first passage, it said, he's, they're leading you away. Or, or the last passage. They're leading you away after other gods. This is a debate I have with other professing Christians that why are you calling out a brother? If they're teaching a different gospel, they're not my brother. If they're teaching a different Christ, that is not my brother. If, this is what we're going to be speaking about this Sunday in the doctrine of the Trinity. If you change who he is, you change the gospel. You change the gospel, there's no salvation in that. That's your, that's your Jesus, not my Jesus. My Jesus is not mine. And, and, and that, is, that, that comes down to moral relativism. That's something that's big in our culture. My truth. No, there's the truth, and then there's what you feel. There's a, there's a Yeti I really want to get from this young man. It says if he says I could I could list, or like I could agree with you, but then we'd both be wrong. <laughs> and it's a good it's a good line. Um, but this is the, this is why it's so important. If if we don't if we don't know, not saying we need to fathom and understand God. If we understand God, there's a problem. But if we get him wrong or we change who he is, we change his character, we change his nature, we change the gospel. And if we change the gospel, there is no salvation in that. You've created an idol. You're like, you, you, we're like the children, in, you know, children of Israel in Exodus. We've melted down our gold. We fashioned this idol. But the difference is, is we named that idol Jesus. And when somebody comes along and calls it out, you don't talk about them like that. That's my idol. That's, that's the God I'm worshiping. I'm worshiping this pastor. I'm worshiping this church. I'm worshiping, but it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of idols out there named Jesus. And if we cannot identify them, if we're not willing to identify them, because we're afraid of what people might say or how people might view us, then we're essentially saying, I'm okay with you going to hell for all eternity. And I don't think any of us would ever step, step in line and say that. But our actions are saying, I'm okay. And I want that to, to spur us to get into God's Word. Not, not saying, I want you to go out and make this your personal vendetta like I do. I'm saying, get into God's Word. Hold our leaders accountable. Hold each other accountable so that we can make sure that we are teaching the appropriate gospel. Paul learned under the other apostles for about 10 years before he went out. Why? And then he came back and checked with Cephas. Why? To make sure that he was teaching according to Scripture, according to the Word of God, according to what is being taught. It's okay to, to, to follow up. Are there any questions? Anything you want to add? Anything that you saw that, that you want to mention? I have a question. Yep. So, you know, a lot of churches have gone to very generic names now. The something. You know what I'm saying? So it's hard to tell what their statement is. And a lot of times when you read their statements, they're very generic anymore. Yeah. So here's so I actually have to do this for a friend. I have a friend who moved out to Utah, and I want to find him a good church. Well, here's what you got to do. Because if you go on statements of belief, they're all going to say the same thing. Everyone knows Christianese is going to say the same thing. Unless it's a super charismatic church, then just look for doves all over the thing. Um, you got to call them. My thing is, is, you call the church and ask to speak to the preacher. If you can't reach the preacher, move on. If their preacher's not reachable, move on. But what questions would you ask? Ask particular doctrine. Because they're going to... Yeah. They're going to code it in a way that will still make you come. So ask, ask questions that don't allow them to code it. For example, you can say, do you guys, do you guys teach the doctrine of the Trinity? Okay. Um, can you give me an example of that? And if they do the water example, that's modalism. That's not Trinity. Um, you can ask them about certain moral ethical issues. Where does your church stand on LGBT? Where does your church stand on, um, 
on, on women elders? Where does your at? You can't hide behind those. Yeah, those things are easy. Yeah. But kind of like the word of faith type, you know, the prosperity gospel. That seems to be kind of hidden really well with you know until you are actually in. The Does that make sense? They aren't going to yeah, say, yes and say, "Hey, yeah, we're a prosperity." You know. Yes and no. Um, there are very telltale signs. They'll talk about prosperity. They won't if they talk about money a lot. Talk about sowing a seed. These these teachers, man, they talk about money all the daggum time. I that's my least favorite. That's why I do it once a year at the beginning of the year and never touch it the rest of the year. I hate it, but it has to be discussed because it is in the Bible. But I would much rather talk about something else. But it seems like all they're going to talk about is money. Give, give, sow, sow. Those are key words. You know, sowing a seed is definitely a key word. But to be honest with you, if you're actively in the word, if say the scriptures they cite, you know how she cited 1 Corinthians 14? Just pull that one little verse out. If they're citing one verse and then espousing 20 minutes, there's a good chance they took that verse out of context. Does that make sense? Look, I love dissecting the word of God. And I love getting into the language. I love getting into the words. It's tough to get 20 minutes out of one verse. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, probably you can do it. But it's tough. But for that, the rest of the... No. They're taking it out of context. So it does require discernment. If discernment is not your spiritual gift, then I would recommend getting a friend who does have that spiritual gift and say, I want you to attend this church with me for a month. And I want us to debrief and talk about it. And if they and if and if you guys are searching the word and they're using their spiritual gift of discernment and 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 they're helping you through it and you guys go look this does seem like a, a sound biblical church, then yeah. But then say something comes up and you go to the leadership and they don't do anything about it, or if they rebuke you in that or they suppress. Bye, Felicia. I don't have time for this. You know. So there's there are good churches out there. But there are, for every good church, there's about five heretical ones. So it does take time. It does take energy. Start by calling, then go search the Word of God, maybe bring a friend who has the gift of discernment, and, and do it that way. Does that seem reasonable? Anybody, anybody have anything to add to that that you, that you would recommend? Yeah, watch videos, like if they've got videos of the preacher, I recommend watching their services online. That's what I did. <laughs> Especially with COVID. I mean, everybody went online. There's going to be a lot of stuff for you to watch online. And it was really interesting. I don't know. Oh, crap. I'm sorry. I kept you guys way over. Um, that's what I have when I don't look at the clock. One of the really interesting things was these particular churches that will um, seem like it's a super emotional hype. When, when they don't have their bullpen hyping their sermons, when they're getting riled up and you're like, that just sounds stupid. But whenever they have their bullpen, it's, it's oh, amen, man, preach it. Then it seems like it's profound. It means that the hype is the only thing making it profound. It's, they're not actually saying anything. They actually call it, the, the, the term is called pseudo-profound bovine scatology, which is, it sounds smart, but it's full of doom. So, all right, well, let's close in prayer. I apologize for taking you all over. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, for this time we get to spend together. I pray, Father, that we would apply your word, that we would get into your word, that we would fall more and more in love with your word, that we can not only uh, examine our own lives through the Holy Spirit, but also that we can hold each other accountable to help each other to grow in knowledge and truth, that we can know you a little bit more each and every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.